I just went outside, did a little test, painted a light bulb with clear, and we are at 99.9% .9 humidity, and I don't want to run the risk of putting any, or it really could be spraying clear the next couple of days, but I'm really at a point where I don't want to risk it. I put so much work into this, I just don't think it's really worth even, I'm just going to wait for a day when the humidity is down. You know, now I could be inking, but I'm really just... I'm saving the ink work on this for a day that I have a dedicated day. I don't have shop work. I want to do it on a weekend day if possible. Because what happens when I start inking and I have to keep my hands clean and things like I don't want to be doing this and then running a drill press and making carbon gear and things like that. So I want to save this for a dedicated day. And what happens now is when I get to this point, I really have to start showing some patience. And I'm really itching just to get out and, and just finish off the clear and get the buffing. There's just a point at which you have to show some patience, and I'm at that point today. So what I've decided to do is, because we're looking at maybe having a weekend flying session this weekend, I'd like to get the, the pavement gear for Miss Ashley done if I can today. Then we have this humidity level, and I mean, we are really, at it, for April, this is just the most ridiculous thing. The temperatures are in the high 90s mid to high 90s, the humidity, you can cut the air with a knife. Even my pilot here gets sweaty. It's a little Georgino pilot. Now, whenever we set up, at least in the past what I've tried to do, I have these little ways that I'm comfortable with setting up landing gear. What, what is really a nice way to do it though, is that you have to know where the CG is in the plane before you can really set up the wires or what happens you wind up bending them back and forth back and forth but they get a good square one place to mount the gear I always use the little thing the little trick that once once I have the plane balanced and the plane has to be balanced to do this is to hold the nose down let go of the plane and it should just just very gradually go up if it goes slams down you could be bending the gear further and further back so we find that location, let me answer the phone, we find that location where the wheels want to be first. Okay, now what happens, so that you understand what happens, if the wheels are very far forward, and I've tried to exaggerate this in this drawing, when the wheels are too far forward, plane is flying in on its center of gravity, you pick the nose up just a little bit to flare it in, that would be, no but the wheels are in front of the center of gravity. So as soon as they hit, See what happens? They change the angle of attack, which usually results in a bounce. Now, the first time I flew the plane was on grass, so I had the grass gear already done. That's not a problem at all. That, that worked out, and on a grass gear, you could just move them in an extreme forward position so that you don't chip a prop or whatever. But when I'm on tar, what I like to do is I like to be able to land with the gear so that the gear are under the center of gravity. In other words, it has to push up on the whole plane, not push up and change the angle of attack. So if you can picture what that's like, when I'm set up just right in the landing mode, the gear are gonna be just ever so slightly in front of the CG. So that when they push up, they don't tend to dramatically change the angle of attack. And if you have that concept, it's a, you, you can almost, I, I'll bet, if I look at the old Nats footage, I'll bet it's been 
you know, a, a couple of years anyway since I've bounced. You really have to try to bounce a landing. And there's nothing more frustrating than coming in with a plane and you're flaring, flaring, flaring. At the last minute it hits and, and bounces right. So this eliminates one of the things if you get the pavement gear just right. This really eliminates one of the problems. But one of the things I'm very cautious of is when I have the gear blocks, and of course this would go for, really, for any plane. I want the gear wires to be bent so that, and I did this on the last video, we've done this many times, hopefully the lead out position would be semi-permanent now where we're only going to move a very little bit, we're close, so that we can maintain a relatively close line. I don't want the gear pointed out. The worst thing is having pointed out because when the model's released, it'll turn out and then snap back. Well, we like to have, if we could, have an imaginary arc. So when you look from the center, both of them would be just a little bit canted in. Now the way to get around this, if you're not real accurate in bending wire, is put slop in the wheels. Now I remember John Brodak's scale plane had real tight wheel bearings years ago and it wouldn't track right. Well, all you have to do is put slop in the wheels. The slop makes up for the track if it's wrong. If it's right, well, that's great. In the old days, we used to take a plane and just push it down a driveway. That, that didn't do much good. Planes would go as straight as could be or turn, and as soon as the motor's pulling it, everything would change. So my feeling is to start with, if you don't know the wires are going to be right, put a little bit of slop, just like you do in a control system. In my case, I use a drill that's a 145. And the brass bushing that I put in there, the little brass end cap, is 135. So I've got about 10 thousandths of slop in there to start with. But this tracking thing, another thing too, when a plane lands, if all of a sudden it wants to steer away from you, it spoils the rollout. And it'll wear the wheel. These wheels that we use wear out as fast as can be anyway. Another thing too, we're going to have spats or sides on the, on the gear. The trick is to get the wires 90 degrees so we know both of these are tracking just a little bit and then mount the little gear doors 90 degrees to the axles and we have a little trick way of doing that with a triangle so what that does otherwise if these are straight they're going to act as two little rudders because they're relatively flat sided projectiles. Another thing too, if you're having wheel pants, you don't want to have wheel pants that are acting like rudders either. So the way I'm going to do this, I've done it before, it's it's a very good way, you can use it on any model, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a, a cardinal or a, a nobler or what. Same technology applies to everything. It's a good way of doing it, it's a way I've found works for me over and over again. These wires bent, I always use a little a little trick of taking some of the material off the torsion arm, not at the radius and not at the end, just in the middle, that takes some off. And where the, where the spat or the door is going to attach, take a parting wheel or grindstone, anything, and roughen it up just so it's rough. It gives the glue a better tooth on there. I also make up a little pattern that I know the gear doors are. So the first step on this is going to be, I want to get the wires glued to what will be one side of the door. Now the first thing I'll do is I'll cut the first door at a 64th plywood and check that this angle here is 90 degrees. Let's tack glue this down with just a cut. Notice the grain is going in this dimension. Just the slightest bit of CA so I can see if I have 90 degrees without a problem. It's that angle there that I want to make sure I have 90 degrees. And it also serves the purpose, if it isn't 90, one side of the wheel will wear out when you put the slop in it. So it's real real important right now, as that glue, because I can still move it, it's right at 90 degrees. So I can put a permanent glue joint on that part. And of course, no matter what plane, you can make your gear doors like a Mustang or like a, or whatever do the next step is to get end grain never put the grain in this dimension it, it'll be weaker than it needs to be just glue these on fill both sides so that this is I can use up some of my light scrap 
if you have sea grain, it'd probably add a little strength, rigidity, but the main thing is to get it end grain around that wire. That's where you're building your strength from. The whole thing filled with scrap. Now I want to just build this glue seam up in here permanently. I checked that everything is 90 degrees. Because this is capillary, it'll seep into all the nooks and crannies, harden up the end grain. What works well for me is to get a little bit of sawdust down into that ditch, let that just build up. It makes a good bond with the wire. And again, every step of the way, I'll check that I have my 90 degrees. With this, even though this the glue is here, I want this to be a perfectly flat surface, because now I'm going to take a piece of 60 foot plywood with the grain going in the opposite direction. The grain is going to go straight up and down now. So what I'll have is a sandwich with exactly the right thickness the wire really nice and solid. It should be super light when it's done. Again, that word should be is a big word. And the main thing is to get a good contact between the, in this case, the wire. And plenty of glue down around the wire. Make sure it's oozing out in every dimension. As soon as that kicks, you trim it right off. Last thing before this, before I do the trimming and grinding, I want to go around the whole perimeter because I want I want this to be sealed. The thin CA will seal everything up nice. And no matter what shape you have for the wing-mounted gear doors, this way really gives you a nice, a very strong, very light way of doing it. And from this point on, it's just a question of trimming the plywood. Sand the edges nice and smooth. Put our little relief cuts in. I'll do that with a Dremel tool, it'll be just easier. with the Dremel tool. Let's put in a couple of fake lightning holes here. <coughs> now I want to put my real quick finish on here, which consists of a couple of coats of CA, sanded in between coats, and we'll go right into our finish. Now I've been hoping that we're going to be able to paint these today with the humidity just astronomically high. Anyway, the little quick finish that we do just, this will serve the purpose well. But I don't think we're going to be able to get them painted today, that's a problem. Whenever you have this high humidity it just pays to wait. Rich Jacobone's waiting with his stuka patiently, waiting to put the clear on it. I know just how he feels today. Now what I generally do, 
get a paper towel, of course. And it's real simple. There's no trick to this. This you can use on scale models, on small parts, anything that requires a quick finish. You don't want to spend all day doing hundreds and hundreds of coats of anything. Waiting for it to dry between coats. There's no dry time. But once that's sanded off, I do this three, four times. It'll have a nice gloss to it even. Now the next thing is, this is ready for the first coat of paint. And maybe sand it one more time, I'm not sure. But I'll make the, the other leg and make it off camera. What I do is just, this is the glue base. I want to get the first coat of silver on here. And the objective here is just to use it as a, use it as a blocker filler coat. We'll sand this down maybe once or twice. Get a nice finish. If you try to paint something red and you can see the wood grain through, you really need the silver on there. And since we want this to be part of, uh, this will be a final part for the plane. Predicting big thunder showers this afternoon, so I'm trying to rush to get this done. So it can dry outside in the sun, it'll dry quickly. This will be our base for, maybe as soon as this dries, I'll sand it once or twice. Put another coat of silver on, I can do that about 20 minutes apart, and this will be ready for the red. Now, I was going to let these dry outside, but it's starting to look like it's going to rain any minute. So, another thing I found is if I put it by the air conditioner to dry, and I mean six feet from the air conditioner, what tends to happen, it'll take three, four times as long to dry, but ultimately it'll, uh, it'll be a smoother finish. So maybe I'll buy something that way since I have plenty of other things to do. In the meantime, I got the day's shop work to do. This can be drying. Maybe I'll even try to get the red on the last thing of the day, but if I don't, it won't matter. But having this part done is getting me one big step ahead. And this is about how far I keep it from the air conditioner. I've had good luck with the drying. It just takes a little longer, but I, I get a nice smooth layout on the paint. Now, yesterday night, we had the storm. Joe, did you get a storm down by you too? Uh, we rain, but we had the mo we have we're on a drought, but we've been getting rain. This is the most rain we've had, and what happened is that it was so humid three or four days in a row, I couldn't shoot any clear. There's no way you can shoot clear lately. I don't know how much humidity was in the air. Oh, you got them all set, baby. Oh, oh, oh. still looks good, Joe. Okay, this is this is your new pipe. Okay. Did you run this on the ground yet, or glow plug gonna come out of it or anything? No. Hey, I made sure that that was safe. <laughs> okay. I tightened that up, but yeah, 18 okay. inches from here to the 18 one. inches, good starting point. Yeah. And uh, you know, okay, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, let's get get some flights while the air is nice. Or the only thing it. you know about the geese here, if you hear us yeah, yelling geese, 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 geese just fly low. The geese are mating or something over there. I think they opened up a singles bar up the other end of the field. Okay. Out right here flying yesterday. What was it yesterday, Rich? The pipe fell off twice? Yeah, sure. The screws in the header? Yeah, this, what'd you do? You do 632 threads? No, I didn't. You just tightened it up with 440s. You mean the header? Went ahead on. and did the same thing, yes. Okay, so we got to have two flights and we got to take the whole thing apart again, right? Well, that means it's your turn. At the, as soon as this header comes off, you're going to buy breakfast for everybody. With that credit card that your wife gives you that has unlimited uh, expenses. Yeah, that's it. Man. That's the one, right. Bagels for everybody. Flight, we want to see if Rich's header repair is working. One flight. And rather than tap it out 632, he just puts two 440 screws in, figuring what can Wendy possibly know, and then he tries to wipe it off so I don't see that the header's coming off the next flight. <laughs> oh man, I'll tell you, this is Mr. Do It Right the first time. Making a little, putting knurls on Joe's header. Joe doesn't have the, uh, where's that header, Joe? Oh, you didn't do it yet? 
Here's, here's a good little tip. You're gonna you're gonna do a tune pipe, a PA61. Is it 61, Joe? 61. This area here should have some nails with some 80 grit of file. Something. You see how smooth that is? Or what happened? A pipe got loose on the first flight. Didn't fall off, but got loose. Just like the front of this. This is. It's got little circles. You can do with 80 grit paper. You can just do it in an engraving tool. And you got the real good at the red. That couple of materials, the best stuff we have, Joe. So as long as that's centered on there, like equal space on both sides. Right? Yeah, yeah. You got that little piece of pipe, so it's still he runs the pipe at 18. Well, where do you get that stuff, Wendy? What stuff? Ah, uh, McMaster car has it. <coughs> Warren Walker invented that for us. He found it. That's the. Oh no, Noel found it. I'm not sure who gets the credit for that. Not me. Somebody else. So I should scuff this up. Huh? Scuff that up. Either would if you close up the header. I like to use the engraving tool when I do it, but uh, that's a that's a must. That's not a maybe. No, it's got to be rougher than that. Rougher? Yeah. The, the rougher, the better. Okay. I know how you like things all smooth and shiny, but uh, that's got to be rough. And why I found the best is an engraving tool, but this will get us through the day. I'll make them deeper. I just want to you stand this should take me. I don't want to just. You ready? If you ever have your head a fly off, Rich, gonna gonna oh. give Dub's gonna watch this video and he's gonna say, oh boy. This guy learned his lesson the first time. Just goes home and puts the same screws back in. Drill and tap it out. Joe, come on. Are you? And I'm all black and blue. I have to eat my words, Richard. I want it on camera, too. I'm eating my words. He got three flights out of this header. Joe, 25 after eight. Give off fly in sight. The Canada geese. Boy, they're killing us. You show off. Go tighten that header up. Whole side of your plane is full of full of the header. The man does no maintenance at home, and then we're here. The only good air of the day, and he hogs it up tightening headers. One thing about model aviation that I think is exceptional here, Joe and I haven't really flown together in probably almost a year. We're out here early in the morning, 7 o'clock with the geese, on a day that right after a storm. And we're having the best time we've ever had. I hope we're going to be able to get some flights in today, some anyway, but uh, again, Storm came through yesterday, there's still puddles everywhere, but 
We're just trying to steal a day here and there. And there's no way I can go shoot clear. I guess the only thing left I can do is some work on those landing gear. Finish up the extra tar gear. Now seriously, one of the things Rich is having a problem with, the, the screws are probably well on the way to being stripped because even though he put new screws in and tightened them, that's a, that's a, a potential problem because if the whole assembly comes off, it could fly out of the plane and hit <coughs> some innocent person like me or Joe. But to show you the kind of confidence I have in Rich, I haven't even taken my plane out of the car yet. I'm afraid that header's going in the river here before the day's over. Came off twice yesterday. And I think the only cure is going to be to tap it 632. But boy, is it good. The, the beginning of every season like this, we take out the old planes and generally just get together if the weather was going down the drain like it looks like it might we, we have a diner real close to the field here we can go hang out and tell lies and stories or we can go play with the b25 we can go sit there and look at the cockpit and whatever this is one of Karen's favorite planes when the girls did appearance judging one year or they voted for the concourse, I don't remember. They all agreed this was the prettiest of the planes. I don't know what they were thinking. And my, my plane I thought was pretty, but the girls said no. I think it has something to do with Joe's sex appeal, I'll tell you the truth. Anyway, I don't hold out much hope for the day here. It's getting cloudier and cloudier as we go on. But it is already. The 2002 flying season has officially begun. We're closing in on having a B-25 finish. Maybe get some more work with the Z-Tron. Fly the carbon fiber wing ship. Dub's supposed to send me the, the latest updated Jet 60 to test with all the mods and updates. Clapson made a copy of this plane if I don't if I remember right. Kind of a Spitfire elliptical type wing. The pride of Boeing, Joe Adamusco. Now, Rich has actually got, I should really confirm this, this is his fourth flight. He's got four flights, and he's going to go for a fifth. But I predict before the day is over, that header is coming off the plane. Let's see if I can predict the future. Boy, I could be like Nostradamus and predict the future here. Rich, you're going to have to re-tap it, trust me. Look at his body English. Joe, check this body English out. I always think it's significant how people stand during the notes. Let's see, let's see if we can catch some of this English. 
sometimes if you play background music, look, the bent knees, the bent knees are nice. That's a nice touch. Is this man mad at somebody? Look at his face, he's mad. He's going flying, he's having a time of his life. And he's mad. Just basically an unhappy person. Wait to see the look on his face when his header comes off. By the way, the reason I put this on the tape is because it's a serious thing. In some planes, in some cases, when that header loosens up, it, it comes right off the plane. Now, because Rich has this big giant cowl, look at the bent knees. That, that's a nice touch with the knees, Rich. But it just stays inside there and beats everything all to, to hell. But it could fly out and hit somebody. It's a, it's a problem. Well, we'll see if Rich, if Rich makes it through the end of the day, I'll be totally impressed. Nick the Greek is given odds on Wendy, 5-1 to one on the header, 3-1 to one on Jack of Bones. Yeah, we had a great flying session. Even though it looks like it's going to get cut short by rain here, we're going to go up to Rich Jack of Bones' house. I've never videotaped his garage where he does a little, some of his work. And Joe wants to see his stuka. Rich, always quick to show everybody his palatial estate. Actually, it's, uh, actually it's a pretty nice house. <laughs> come on, come on. Buzz Brodak says you haven't been mowing your grass. Let's see if he's been there. Don't you edge your grass? Wow, in my neighborhood, they don't let you let the grass do this. You have to edge it. Wow. It's either flying the plane. Flying the plane is more important. Let the grass go. Look, he's got weeds growing in between the sidewalk. Oh, that's terrible. All right. Let's see this palatial garage. Oh, the squirrels are eating his balls wood. No, this is... And whenever we come to see Rich, he's got his family. They put a polka on. Chet, now you got this, did you rebuild this or did you get it rebuilt? No, this is, this is the way I bought it. You bought, bought it? it rebuilt. Listen, when you make out your will, I need, I need to put a just say, you got to pay for his own you need jukebox. You get some <laughs> I'll bet John Brodak would like this. Buzz, why don't you buy one of these? For, he's probably got one. Look at these old songs. And I used to have these in the old dirt. Oh, isn't this cool? Yeah. Really this thing all lights up at play. Oh my God! Look. Well, this is uh, this is original. That's where he keeps his money. This, <laughs> this is Rich's <laughs> life savings in the bottom of the world. <laughs> there was money in it. So we we just thought you were a talented flyer and builder. I didn't know you had other talents. That's when nice. It starts the bubble. See? And you thought he just made great stukas, huh? That's cool. The quality, the, uh, the sound isn't really that bad. I feel like we're in a, in an yeah, I feel like we're in an Undertaker's parlor here or something. Please. This is some outfit you got. Ooh. Look at this. Look at that. Look at this guy. We had this on the last day. Look at this, Joe. That's outstanding. Stupid one, huh? Stupid one, the stupid. Look, he's been doing. This is where he's doing all his testing. Yeah, yeah. That Matt Newman is toast, man. He's he's toast. He's out of it. Stupid. And you know, the the some of the detail work is is not the way. Look at the cockpit. He did a fantastic job. That's the right side. No, it's fine. Look at the detail in there, the seat belts and everything. I don't know if you can see this through your camera. I got an instrument panel in there. Got all little. Nice, nice, huh, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know what the you know what the problem is here, Rich? It's really humid in this garage. 
I wouldn't dare touch it. You don't have a you don't have a dehumidifier? Yes, yeah, I do. I have it there, but you know, with the weather the way. Oh man, I mean, I'm feeling it's very humid in here. You can't paint. Oh, sure. yeah. no, but wait till the day's right. You yeah. Oh wait! Oh, you'll see the. This is too beautiful, Richard. Man, I tell you, this is. Hey, flip it. We didn't even see the bottom when Dub was up here. And you got the remote needle valve on here. You don't have to. The plug on the side. They can't be. That nice, Joe. Yeah, no, I told him, without the canopy, you may as well not even build the model. And, he, he made the and then, listen, listen to this, he didn't want to make the wheel pants. He was just going to have wire with, with gear coming. You gotta go. Yeah, you've got to make the, look at this. You know, make the easy. wheel pants. Make the wheel pants. Now he says, oh, Wendy, thanks for making me make the wheel This is the cow. He's got the little things on the tail. Listen to that music in the background. Boy, you got, the, you got some lifestyle here, Rich. Man, alive! Yeah, I just gotta get to that. I mean, that shop is like 99% there, man. This is, I love this. I'm gonna flip out and I see a V2. How can I that looks? Now that is super. You, you decided you want to go with two fiber rather than four. Yeah, stroke. yeah. And he's got a special spinner. I got him one of those Russian spinners. See, that's that's a job. That's what I don't like. What's that? It's not finished right. What do you mean? It's it's not it should be sharp. You know, like this rascal makes well, not a clear one. It should be a mold. I told you that before. Why are you trying to blame Joe What's now? I'm not blaming Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Joe. He comes up here to see your plane. Yeah, it's really humid in here. Wow. You can't. No way you're going to uh, paint today. I'm looking at that little remote view. What's that? This is where the uh, hot star okay. plugs in here. Because you see underneath, okay. the, uh, the cowl drops down very low. That's right. That's right. And as a result, it would be very difficult to find the plug. Plus, you need a special uh, hot start, you know, the uh, battery. Did you weigh this yet? No, I'm afraid to. <laughs> Don't weigh it. <laughs> Just go fly it. It'll be fine. It's got a thick wing. Now, what wing are you using there, Rich? It's a uh, cardinal wing. Uh, These are all cardinal moments. Down to 51. They're all the same. Yeah, they're all the same. Oh, I'm waiting. I mean, they're not all the same because, like, my Mr. Awesome is, like, the original cardinal wing. That oh, not the awesome one. No, no, no. This is not an awesome wing. Yeah, you see, the pipe fits in here, of course. Nice tip weight box. That worked out nice. Mm -hmm. And then you got another little cowling will fit yeah, on there. Yeah, I, I got a piece there. Oh, that's nice, right. Fits right here. I'm going to build another one. And the, the next one, I'm going to make... Where's the wheel pants? You got the wheel pants here? The, the, uh, the cowl. My idea, my idea, I had like a yellow, you know, a yellow band or yellow yeah, something yeah. on a rudder, and the cowling was yellow. But this was... Uh, Without the canopy, though, it's toast. The canopy makes the whole plane. Outstanding. Oh, yes. Uh, they're good, but they're not like his quality. You know, his quality is superb. I, I just don't know how to do the work that he does. Just that when you're going to do your test flying, just yeah. use some regular... Yeah, just here. put, just put the wires. It's all trimmed, yeah. yeah I, have I just made up grass uh, like pavement gear for my plane. I have uh, another set of landing gear without... I think this is going to be one of the most exciting planes, and it's as soon as we get, he's having the same problem I am. Neither one of us can shoot clear on a B-25 or this because of the I had one tremendous, shot, one tremendous, you can see the windows even, just too humid. And now if I touch it, you know, with your bare finger, you know, you're Wear the rubber gloves. I've been wearing the rubber gloves all the time to save a, it's all getting it's fingerprints on, on it. Plane. Those are good gloves. You know that uh, acetone doesn't eat holes? going to demonstrate his, uh, H you sure this is an HVLP? Yeah. Looks nice. See it? Look. Yeah, I can see it. You don't yeah. have any overspray. Try it. Yeah, I had one. Uh, I don't have one. Jim Damarell brought one over one day. Yeah, but his is clumsy. He's got the big hose on it. You this know? looks good. See, it's a nice mist. And who makes that gun? This is a. Uh, it's a professional gun that they use in body shops. Oh, your friend at the body it's shop. It's a gun? touch-up gun. Okay. And Jimmy suggested. He said, instead of how much did that cost? One hundred and eighty dollars. Well, you got the money. Sell your jukebox. Still go on. <laughs> Matt Newman doesn't complain about the price of spray yeah, guns. Nice. That looks good. Yeah, no, that's, that is a and a, a Campbell stuff. I've been selling a lot of the Campbell's, the spray, they're bulletproof. Well, the way we problem. use them, 
You know, I'll never have a problem with them. Yes. Yeah. All brought up. The first time Joe's seen it in real life. So. In real life. There you go. You seen it on video. You see it in real life. There it is, baby. That's your de-icer boot on the leading edge, huh? Nice. Yeah. I just wish the humidity would die right now, and we'd be. I got to clear the. I got to ink and clear the wing. Through the hinge, and of course, that's a that's a whole oh, other data. I know that's signal that's your motor. Yeah, that's beautiful. Man. Check out that. You can pick the fuselage right up. You want me to put gloves on? Nah, nah. You can pick the fuselage right up. Who do you think you're at Jack of Bones house? Well, see how this Brodax silver looks. You know that. It's a lot brighter than the mm -hmm. other, the the traditional, whatever we want to call it. Heavy, huh? Heavy, too heavy. Man. Too heavy. Not this, not an elevator weight for sure. Hmm. I know you like the fuselage. It's like a free flight. Yeah. My goodness, plenty. So, do you give your approval there? Oh, yeah, this probably weighs about three and a half ounces. Maybe not even that. My goodness. It's a shame we don't have the bigger wing. That's the only thing that's going to be a. Well, but know. but it's too late. Yeah, I wouldn't make the body any bigger. You're a co-pilot, so if it crashes, if it crashes, you're in big trouble. If it doesn't fly right off the butt, you like the way the windows came out? Mm -hmm. You have the touch. With that's that. all Brodak, 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 baby. What are you going to use for 50 calibers? You're going to make some out of carbon fiber tubes. I know a guy like you that sits and whittles stuff like yeah. that away. I got some carbon fiber tubing. I don't know. Do you really need them? Yeah, I guess so. What angle of attack would you put on? I don't know. Shooting at the judges wherever they are. <laughs> or maybe thanking them. I don't know. So, how many coats on here? Or is this buffed? This is done. No. No, it's not buffed or done or anything. It's ready for the rest of the clear. Uh oh, uh -oh Chicky's Chicky's attacking. I know attacking. he likes my. Uh, oh yeah, he loves he you. Wants to build a nest up there. Yeah, he, he sees goes. he sees nesting materials, nesting materials. Chicky, lunch I know is that served. I don't do anything quick or rash, but that red, yeah, you know, it looks better with clear on it than uh, just the. Uh, well, you know what the weather's been like lately. We've just been crazy with this weather. Okay, Chicky. This is the only part of the plane that's buffed so far as the stab and elevators. Everything else has got to be buffed. Okay, so you think Downey's going to be impressed? You think you like it? You think you like that nose section? Yes. I can't wait to finish it. I'm really, really itching. Now, Joel and I really had a great visit, and we've got a plan for something. I know, I know Ron Merrill's going to like this. Joe's researching out a a P6 Hawk as a biplane project for the future. He's going to try to get Dave Downey to do some research on this Hawk thing with the claws on the wheel pants. Had a great day. Anyway, I've had this. We've actually had this on a plane once already. Never even never really gave it a fair shot though for two reasons. Number one, we didn't have the correct fuel, and we didn't know how to use it. So, Doug Jet. Needless to say, would like to uh, help us out here. He sent us this. And of course, I'm reading the directions, and everything he says not to do, we've already done. So we really haven't given it a fair shot. And we now have the big fuel, the big giant jet fueler, which is like a big giant SIG fueler marked in ounces. Double O-ring seal, some tubing, and a giant filter. And the most important thing we have, I mean, it's so important, it's unbelievable. We have directions how to use this. So, the next earliest opportunity I get, we're going to try to retrofit up and I'll be able to fill. You see, the whole trick with the jet system is if you read the directions, and of course I'm not prone to do that, but uh, Dub has been nice enough to send the directions. Send one of these fuelers, and I'm, I'm looking at how nicely this is made. This is like a plunger deal. Actually, I wonder if you could use this just to fuel a plane. It'd be pretty cool. Kind of a neat thing, anyway. But 
what I would suggest is anybody that's interested in this, just contact Dubjet on the website, of course. But, but the other thing is, don't be like Wendy. Read the directions. Read them carefully. There's a lot of do's and don'ts in there. Well worth the time you spend reading them. Now you can see how our last coat of silver's dried up here. And before I put what I hope will be the final coat of silver on this, I always want to radius all the little edges. Because we have a CA base on this, there's really no filler other than the silver. So a couple minutes with the some 600 sandpaper will make for a pretty nice finish, I hope. And we'll be ready to do some pavement rollouts once we get this done and some, I hope, some realistic landings with the tail wheel held up high and of course we'll always have the grass gear for flying at the club field which is the best of all worlds is when you have two sets of gear and you can just change them you're flying grass flying pavement flying grass flying pavement And it looks like the weather has gotten colder again, but we did take advantage of a little gap in the weather here to get some little, some fly-in days, spend some time with Joe Musco. And actually, to be honest, the, as I get older and older, these days that you really uh, socialize more than fly, they seem to be the best days of all. And by the way, I got it. We we talked about in my kitchen. I wish I would have recorded some of this about this potential future project of a uh, of the Hawk, that biplane. I know that's going to make Ron Merrill crazy. Ron, go find me some pictures of that Hawk. Dave Downey is secretly, secretly. I don't think he really knows that I know yet, but working on a uh, a biplane of his own design. We hope we'll have some pictures of the, the, the drawings relatively soon. Anyway, let me get a paper towel. This is going to be ready soon for the last coat of silver, a coat of red, and maybe four or five coats of clear. And you can see, still see some of the grain. I want to get most of it out of there. But it still saves some time over doing a traditional where you would put the tissue on and have all the days of waiting for those things to dry out. This is just, I just call this the quick finish. You can use this on repairs, using that CA base. I think I've written about it in Stunt News before, but I'm probably going to write about it again because on little parts like this, very practical, very quick, very convenient. We're ready for our last coat of silver. That looks like it's gonna. One more coat will do it. Now, of course, you could put as many coats of silver as you want on, as long as you sand them off, and just leave that last coat nice and thin. Once this dries, we can spray up the red. I always like to make sure that before I put any color paint on, I have enough enough coats of silver that it's going to act as a nice substrate. Yeah, that should be ready right now. One of the nice things about the Miss Ashley Red is that if you go over silver, it really is a bright, bright color. The color that I really like. And of course, because it's Brodac, it's going to be, when it's done, it's going to shine. Now this is what we've really been waiting for, some rainy days. 
because I wanted to have dedicated time to work on this B-25 wing. But the first thing I want to do, I want to get the landing gear finished. This way they can be dry and see it's all in time management. For me anyway, it's all time management. Get the landing gear dry and I want to get that bubble tank mounted. So I'll have all of the, jo all of the jobs that I normally don't need in decent weather for except for test running the test plane. But always I get the maximum out of a rainy day. And into every B-25 a little rain must fall. We're predicting three or four days of this right in a row. Next thing is to get a coat of clear on the gear legs. Now because the gear legs, there's no canopy to deal with, no ink lines. I'm going to just put retarder right in the clear to start with. Put 10% retarder in. I'm going to spray them right by the door of the cellar. Because I want to get these dry in. See the idea is to, to get these things done when the weather is not good. So when the weather is good, we can go out and get some tests flying. And we're ready to start flying at Palisade Park, but I really would like to have the, you know, the, uh, the pavement gear ready. One of the things, you know, I always try to, I really try to encourage other people to do as well as do it on my own, is to use time management well. Whether it's for modeling or for life in general or for uh, a hobby related thing. But on rainy days, I try to plan rainy day projects. Now you can see, if you look right in the camera, I'm painting in the rain. Now there's, there's a little bit of retarder in here. There's about 10% retarder. The problem is it's going to need more than 10% retarder, I'll bet. But I'll, on, a, on the case of a little part like this, I'll monitor it for half an hour. If it starts to fog up, I'll just put a little more retarder in the paint. Put it on light. You don't want to put on big, thick, heavy coats when it's raining. If we get any fogging, it'll just be a question of adding a little bit of retarder. Nice, not a thick coat, a thin coat. Now we've got our stuff. This is going to dry up. We'll probably get two or three more coats on that as the day goes by, but like I said, they are predicting rain, rain, rain. A little bit of retarder, as long as you're not worried about melting the canopy, or melting inclines, it really will be no problem at all. We'll actually by tomorrow be able to put a little gorms on this, put it on the plane, and be ready to go. Now I'm just looking at our test plane here and again thanking John Gayuski who donated this to our course. Some of the things we've learned to Elliot Scott who donated some Medusa props. One of the things we learned and Richard Oliver of course had good luck with these props also. We've learned a I think we've learned enough about the jet. We've learned enough about having a little helicopter carb. Now the plan of action is I'm going to mount the bubble jet tank and get a couple more days of flying of course because we're not ready to mount the engines in the B-25, but having this little test plane has really, now, one of the things that's significant, you can look at where the glow plug is and where the center line of the tank is. I would guess the tank, to be level, has to be almost a little less than a quarter of an inch higher than the tank when it's mounted in a profile. We've had exceptional luck with the clamp mount. We've never even had a tightness screws. We've been able to use this plane to test our Zetron, and what it's made for us is that when this hardware or package goes right into the B-25, and these are the tanks that are going to go in the B-25, this tank will already be pre-cleaned. And I'll try to be, before I actually mount up and fly the B-25, put the other tank on here. I'll cap this one off right now. These will be flushed, cleaned, ready to go. I won't be in the middle of a flight. It'll pick up or something in the filter or whatever things that can happen. The little mufflers that Bob Zambelli made up and he's making up another set right now. These have been working fine. So we've learned a lot in a very short amount of time. Had some really good fun flying. Even Dubjet got to fly this. So, And now we're closing in on having a B-25 finished. I want to finalize all the other things that I can. And hopefully if we get a break in this rain, get a day or at least at least one flying session on that bubble tank. I want to learn how to fuel it and how to do it the way Dubs suggests and thankfully we have directions and of course we have Dubs phone number. Always nice when you can call up the guy that makes the product and get his information.
the other thing this is going to allow us to do is we know we have to be a little less than a quarter inch above having this universal tank mount said a lot of times little things like this just make make a test a test plane and a competition plane you know, the requirements are a little bit different and in the case of a test plane you want to be able to plug and unplug parts right on and off and that's the case right now so we have one tank for our B25 absolutely flushed and ready to go I'll wipe this off break the safety wire and we'll get, we could just put the bubble jet tank right in the same position this tank was in this was our little mount the way we mounted this if this were a steel tank I'd suggest using those Brodac clips because it allows you to raise and lower the tank infinitely adjustable but in our case we don't want to, we, there's no realistic way to attach the brass to the carbon fiber but what this allows us to do is just break the safety wire now and of course we have plenty of safety wire courtesy of Dan Banjock we have that double sided tape on there I have to pry that off too I want to be delicate with the tank of course I don't want to what I better do is get a brand new blade and get in there. I learned is these tanks drain right to the last, there's probably one or two drops of fuel left in, so we've got a good, nice run characteristics and nice shut off. Motors were shutting off real nice, I want to clean this. I used this double sided tape and what I wanted to see if it would happen if this reacted the same way a lot of glues do, just by warming it up. it would soften the glue because I don't want to just force it. And if I'm going to force it up, it'll be on the end cap. Okay, I can always put this in a microwave. Yeah, see, it's sort of the, the heat. Again, this is a John Brodak uh, little tip that he gave us. Something to always keep in mind with tape. Heat. Heat seems to. Let's see if this does it. Good tip no matter what, the heat seems to let the glue delaminate nice and neatly. Well, and a lot of times you have a piece of tape on something and you just you're just nervous as a cat trying to get it off. In this case, I don't want to fracture the tank or anything like that. But what I could do. I've been kind of resisting this idea, but I guess I have to do it. I'll tell you, the way this glue looks, I think that this would hold the tank on. You wouldn't even need the safety wire. Wow, that's some strong stuff, that double-sided tape. Anyway, heat will get the rest of this off. Heat and a little bit of acetone. So what I did, I tried a couple of different solvents. The best of which is Sickens M600, just gets this right off. You can peel it off with your fingernail after that. Let it soak for a minute. I don't want to use a sharp tool because I don't want to scratch the tank, put a fracture in it. Now we're going to seal this up. I checked it for leaks already. But we know this is kind of a, a semi-proven piece of equipment. And again, with the B25, I don't want to have things. You could do this even on a, you know, on any plane. It's to use a tank that you know doesn't it doesn't have any schmutz in it or any garbage it just eliminates on that first flight or first couple of flights some of the things we want to eliminate see what I'm doing is just rolling it all up again on that first flight first couple of flights how many planes I've had that halfway through the flight and in this case we won't even know if one engine's going dead lean and the other one doesn't or and we have to still figure out a way of synchronizing the motors. But looking at this double-sided tape now, I've learned another thing. This is really strong stuff. See how it's rolling right off like the rubber cement? Amazing. Final thing, just clean the whole tank up with Sickens M600, remember? Because it's carbon, you never will get any rust or corrosion. 
need, you don't need to put fuel in the tank. In fact, I would suggest not putting fuel in the tank when you store it, but just capping it off. We're going to cap it off with some of our little overflow caps. And now we have one part of the B-25, I'd say, ready for a test flight. And it's as really as simple as this. I don't want to make it any more complicated than it has to be. This is one part that we will not have to hopefully not have a problem with, not have to be putting a plane upside down and cleaning filters or anything. One part of the B-25 done. Tested, ready to put in a plane. After we test the bubble tank, I'll do the same thing with this tank. So these two tanks, when they're in the plane, hopefully that'll be one less thing we have to worry about when we're tuning the engines, synchronizing the carburetors, etc., etc. This looks like it's going to be a really tight fit on here, but I hope it's not going to be so tight that uh, I won't be able to use it. Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to be able to shim it. Oh yeah, maybe I am. Maybe I am, but how am I going to get at the back belt? That's a good question. Okay, I can put this. I have an idea. Now, with the piece already in place, and I'm going to put a piece of foam in between, just to make sure that I'm not wearing a hole in that tank. But this will get us almost in the position we need to be in. It's raised right to the point it was with the with the other tank, but I'm not sure because it does hit the back of the engine, it's not going to be a little crooked. But we know, one of the things we know then, if this, if this works the way we expect, we just need to get a little shorter bottle, which I'm sure we can, somewhere in a drugstore, we can have the bottle. In fact, we can make this bottle out of so a piece like that, out of carbon fiber, maybe. Maybe I'm just thinking we could take a carbon, I wonder what Dub would say. Take a carbon fiber tank and leave the end cap off. We could mold something like that. Let's see how heavy this is. Oh, yeah. Anyway, a lot of possibilities, but we do want to get this tested, and a rainy day like this is a good day to do this kind of work. Certainly not going to risk or waste a flying day, a day we could, one of those rare days we could be flying. It's worked out. This looks like it's hitting the back of the motor, and it is, but it's still a free flow here, so I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work. We certainly have enough that we can run the motor and try it. Now, I don't want to make these too tight. I don't want to pinch the tank. Yeah, that's solid enough. This will, and we're at the same mean average height as the other tank, so that'll give us a reference. And the zip ties will be a nylon to nylon uh, friction point. Now this normally would go to a pressure fitting, but we don't have a pressure fitting on this muffler. I'm going to have to see if Dub says this is, if this can just get exposed to the air or if I need to make a pressure fitting. And of course that'll be, that won't be a big deal. I'll ask Dub in an email today if that's what had before we actually run the motor. But that looks like that's going to work. And if it does, these tanks are readily available. We get to use that big fueler and uh, simulate the way they fuel and the fuel draw and the fact that there's no air in the tank. Well, we're not going to know this unless we try it. You know, torque is cheap, trying is expensive and time consuming, but we're going to get out to the field probably very soon, as soon as it stops raining, and give this a shot. Well, we finally arrived at the day we've been waiting for for so long, a rainy day. It's a dedicated day. I basically have a, a giant chunk of the day that I can work on and I'll do. And it's always my objective on these kind of things to start on the bottom first. I can get out my reference manual, wipe everything down with M600, and start laying out whatever ink lining pattern. And of course I'm going to have to match to where the cowlings are to some degree. But if I can get even just the bottom done today, the top tomorrow, then when the rain stops, which is projected for about three days, the nice thing will be the clear on this can be drying. While this clear is drying, the clear on a fuselage will be ready to buff. That clear has been drying for, well, a week already, some amount of time anyway. 
So we already have the tail buffed, the fuse ready to buff, and this ready for ink. So we do the obvious thing always, is you run out and get a giant big cup of coffee going. Get your hands clean and get the ink pens out. I always like to start on the bottom first because it does take me some time to get into my uh, rhythm or whatever you want to call it for this kind of work. I like to outline the box that I'm going to work in and I'll explain why when I go to do the edging. And we're trying to simulate this close to being a stock, a, uh, a realistic prototypical ink line pattern, but we're not going to be fanatically dedicated to having every rivet in a place that a scale plane would have it. We're much more favoring having a, a fantasy kind of model. Now one of the things I want to try to use on this, because I have a lot of compound curves, you see how this is? This has a very unique shape where one side ink won't run under it. And what happens, you bend this and it stays bent so you can make these kind of curvy ink lines. The first thing you have to do is get out all the curves. And I wanted to try, if I can hold this in position somehow, let's see how that would work. You can't, ah, uh, see the problem, it, it doesn't bend this way easily. Oh, so that's going to be a problem. But anyway, what, this, what I can do now, I can use this for, it won't be, I, I thought I could get an ink line out of this, is I can get maybe half of it done and then kind of roll it, or I can get the curve that I want and then just make a plywood template up. Not sure how I'm going to do this yet. Time for that cup of coffee. Now what I, I thought of the easiest way to do this is just use up some 64 plywood, get a nice edge on it, because we're going to use this, let's hope, in uh, several different spots. I need to put the tape on both sides because I'm going to use it in a reverse mode on the other side. But what this will allow me to do is get an ink line. Actually, I had it upside down. With that curvature, something, something similar to that curvature. Now I have to put the tape on both sides of this, so this now will be my template for the, maybe both sides, maybe I can use this on both sides, I don't know, but I thought, now if you have a flat area, see, if this, if we were going in this dimension, we could lay it right on the wing and use this. I never took into account that you really can't bend this. As you bend it, it, it twists. So even though I, I'll find something to use this for, I'm still committed to making a whole bunch of these that are going to be for curved angles. And you can make the, the, for one sheet of plywood, you can ink a whole plane. Now to have that piece taped in place, it's going to be a little difficult to work in there, but let's see if we can get it. And the trick is don't move the part, the the template until the ink is dry. So there's no chance I'll smudge it and have to do it over. But by by making these templates, well I guess the blue thing isn't a total waste because you use it for a pattern. Now just let that dry and as soon as it's dry, just carefully peel that back, and I'll have one of the inclines in place. We just want to get some ideas. We're not going to try to make a total simulation, but I can get an idea that we have one running the main, one this way, and then this one divided in half. That'd be a good place to start. Now, when you're doing a, a line over an airfoil, see, if you have a rule, let me just show it, and you're trying to bend it, well, it's difficult, but if you have these flexible templates with a little piece on one side, this can be relatively easy. Relative is always a big word, because I can be doing this while that other side is drying. And that's always a nice way to have it happen.
This get, lets me line up the line. I know I need to end right at the ink, right at the other ink line. And always good to plan ahead that one is drying while you're working on the other side, assuming you want to do this in, you know, a reasonable amount of time. Inking can be really time consuming. But when it's done, and we'll do a little shading and highlighting. Now I always like to just let it dry, just easier than... Now on this side, this one is probably dry already. So what we can do is just carefully pull this up. And we have one of our ink lines done. And we want to peel this back. And now the trick is using a ruler to connect the dots. Please try to have some tape holding the ruler if possible. That lets me get a better alignment. In fact, this one is not aligned. Okay. Again, if we can capture the flavor of this without making it a rivet for rivet replication, and I think we can. Now, I'm not sure this is going to be exactly how I want it, because the leading edge has a couple of span to span joints that I want to try to replicate if I can. But I always find it easier to just lay out a box to work in before I do anything else. Otherwise I'm just like I'm it's like building a house in midair without a foundation. I don't I don't have a reference point. Remember, we're going over the gold part of this wing, which is another fact that it makes it difficult. Just right here, it's difficult. In fact, I'm going to have to use a flexible ruler down there. This last piece, the gold part of it, is a problem. So I can go right about up to there, and then the pen starts coming off the... Still no problems, nothing we can't work around that bows down the, the hard ruler wouldn't let me connect the lines as accurately as I'd like. Now this is another alternative is just use the flexible part even though it would be nicer if you could do it in one shot of course. The thing with all inking is it's a compromise of what you can do when you're going around curves and edges. Now, even though we don't have good corners on this, because it's just difficult to get the corners right at this point, the best thing is to just let them dry. If you look at these corners, you'll see they're kind of uneven. Right now, that doesn't even matter. Once that dries, I can take a brand new blade, Not sure if you're going to see how this. First, it has to dry. You can't do it while it's wet, and just basically make a corner. Now oh, I know that's a little bit too big up there. Even though you see the scratch marks on the silver, once what will happen once the clear hits that, you won't see that at all. I laid out one of the span lines just as an idea of just to see how I would like to do this. 
get a feel for it. Now I want to lay out the midline and the midline this way. I'd measure it off, of course. Make sure it's accurate. Again, I put a little dot on my dimension so that I know this is where I want it and it's equal. Just carefully clean up the corners, the little spots that inevitably get in the corners. This line is that kind of central line that goes almost all the way down. You can see what I've done. Is just let that dry. Now, just to start off, because I don't want to get, again, that, that magic thing of one too many ink lines. That looks very, very close to what I had in mind. And I don't want to push it by starting to put too many details in here. I want to try to have similar things so that from, you know, from in a mind's eye, for in a distance, it has that look. A little section in between the nacelles. A lot of these lines continue on in, and I'm going to just do, and I'll do it off camera. Just, just something. I'm going to make it as close to being what that drawing is, but I don't want to get carried away here. If it doesn't look, because don't forget, this is not a scale wing. That adds another variable into it. But having the books, having lots of drawings, having lots of ideas is always a good idea. Now I think what I'm going to be able to do. I'm really lucky, and I'm never lucky, is use this on that side. I actually may be able to use it four times. Now that worked out just about as well as I could expect. This is a straight line here. I'll use my flexible rule on that. And then I need to continue these lines on through to the nacelles and out the other side. Almost like there's, there's an imaginary thing going on there. In some areas, <laughs> obviously you can't get a ruler in there conveniently, rather than make up templates. I can take one of these, uh, these green guys that's real flexible and just hold it with my bare hands. In between, it's just very difficult to get in there. And now I need to continue this line. And what I did, I lined it up with the back of the gear door. So I'm going to have to put another bend in this. And this I'll just have to do by eyeball, lining up with that, which looks pretty scale. To be honest, this looks a lot more scale than I thought it would. The trick is not to make it too busy. Once it gets too busy, it starts to look like, I don't know, like something unrealistic. Now a quick look at that, and I'm a quick look at my book, and I think I'm really close to what I wanted, what I had envisioned. I'm figuring out while I'm inking the other panel, again I'll do that off camera because 
it's going to be exactly a re replica of that. I want to figure out how to put the bomb door in realistically, or as realistically as possible. Again, this part of it, I wish there was another way to make to do it, but just very time consuming. And now I want to figure out when I do my shading and highlighting, this will really accent it up nicely, I think. And there's a couple of things like the fuel drains and some of the other little scoops and things that we can simulate with ink. But again, I, I'm going to just work on it. I know I've got about three days to do this. And the trick is just don't, when you get to the point where you think you need one more line, that's probably the part where you don't need an extra line. Too much ink, just tell you, just, once it gets too busy, it's a problem. as a quick example this is a plane that I know I wasn't happy with when I got done inking this none of it made sense like there's there's things that don't make sense in the back here what is that what is that supposed to be I don't know it, I was very disappointed it just just didn't make sense that that ink was there so now I'm, I've been more discriminating in where I put an ink line and if you if you like I said if you miss one and don't have one I don't think anything bad happens. When you have one too many, oh. Again, none of this is realistic. That's not what an airplane looks like when you take it apart. Even a, not that anything we're doing is super realistic, but here's a good example of what not to do. I mean, what would that possibly, what was I thinking, see? What was that, an Allen bolt holding the fuselage together? I mean, I don't know. So, I've come to my own little baby conclusion that if I'm wrong, I want to be wrong with one not enough instead of one too many. One of the planes I was real happy with, and Joe Musco, I mean, he his ink work is flawless, just absolutely flawless. I was really happy with the way this looked because it just was enough. It just didn't just didn't go over the edge, over the top. And when I was done with it, and of course, it won the concourse, so that I couldn't have been totally wrong. <laughs> oh, that isn't really a test. Anyway, these two, I was real happy with the ink work. And I think as, as time goes by, I'm getting, I'm doing less lines, less work, but they have to be more realistic. That's the direction I want it to go in. It actually has a very limited amount of ink, especially on the fuselage, but every one of them is something that represents a real panel line or, or whatever that I really think that the uh, Maximize the amount of time and the amount of ink that's on it to be real as realistic as possible. And the Typhoon, I think, was one that that I was happy with anyway. That it just didn't go that extra little bit where it started to look unrealistic. Just enough panel lines, just enough shading, and that's that's a hard thing to define how to get it. It it's almost like a, just put them on, and at some point in time, you know you have to stop. well into the the final part of having this inked looking at anything else I might want to add again I'm being real careful not to go crazy with the ink I just don't want it to get too busy I want the focus to be on that nose section and on the cowls I don't want this to steal attention away from that now I don't know if I'm going to put any or some riveting on this because again I'm I'm real conscious of the fact that I don't want this to get too busy. See some of the drawings you can see have different kind of inking patterns and lettering I mean um, riveting patterns and what happens is uh, once it gets too busy it uh, it starts to look like that that a dumpster plane that I keep a picture of around and the reason I keep a picture of that is what not to do with an ink pen. I think this is more effective, it looks more realistic, and it just, it lets the model look like a quality instead of a quantity model. And again, I want the focus to be, this is the focus of the plane, is the nose, the turret. The front part of that is where I want your eye to be drawn, not, not to the wing center section or to the, the part here. But once I put it all together in one piece, if I see I need to add a little detail or add some shading, because before I put the clear on, I'll assemble the whole model and then then kind of kind of like an, I guess, like an artist would look at a painting and say, uh, you know, what do we want to do? Add something or take something away? 
but so far I think at least I'll have overnight to think about this relative to drawing. Now I want to look at the Bombay doors. I can't make them totally scale, but boy can I get them close. Because right here is where they would end. They would start here, end here. So I can lay out the, bomb, the Bombay doors in tape and use that as, get that done as the next step because I'll have most of the stuff on the bottom done then and hopefully uh, at the end of today I'll have the bottom finished up. Now, I didn't realize until I laid it out with tape just how big those Bombay doors are. They're really large. So what I'm doing, I'm, I'm trying to get it, and it really is fortunate that our take-apart piece is almost the perfect size. Lay it out with tape, of course. But I'm going to try to do just to make it look a little different. And again, one of the things I always subscribe to the idea is some of the lines should be a little thicker, some a little thinner. These would be the most dominant lines and the lines for the doors where the gear are going to retract into. So I'm going to use the one size bigger pen to do these. Let's make sure we got ink in this pen. This is a 120. I have a wide pen. If I don't, again, a nice thing about ink, if you don't like it, wait till it dries and just wipe it off. A lot of times when you're doing wide lines like this, the problem is they want to do those little fisheye things. A cure for that is you can wipe the part with talcum powder. I'm just too lazy to go upstairs and get another, bo another box of gloves. I'm out of gloves right now. But I'll get them sooner or later. The gloves really have been a giant help. I don't know why I'm so lazy today. Now this line is going to be a focal point because everybody knows there's a Bombay door here. In these wide lines it's just best to just let them sit. Now you may not see it on the, on the camera but the dominant lines, the ones that are done with the 120 pen, they kind of override these so your eye is immediately drawn to the ones that are dominant which is what we'd like to do because I want to lay out the, the, the well doors here the same way as the bomb do, the Bombay doors. Wide lines really take a long time to dry I, and I'm always impatient to get rocking and rolling on this but I just have to I just have to be patient. This is uh, probably all I'll get done today is to finish the bottom of these what amounts to be the bottom of the nacelles. See I'm, I'm really really trying to control my um, really looking forward to getting this in one piece and flying it. And it's hard to control that, that uh, at least for me anyway. It's like going to the ice cream store and you're, the guy's taking his time putting the ice cream in the cone or the, the sundae or something. But I don't want to rush it and that's where, I guess one of the things I've had trouble over the years really learning is patience. Just the patience to do it right. Nice part about having it all laid out in tape is you can really monitor exactly where these lines are going. And another thing, when you go around a round or a curved surface, what tends to happen, the line doesn't want to stay straight. It wants to run off on an angle. So that's where these thin templates come in. And I can kind of get the center of the line set. Now in this case, I need to move the tape. It's good if I can avoid putting the tape over an ink line because it may have a tendency to pull it up. But now I can, uh, in essence, adjust this line infinitely. Look at it from a lot of different angles. I want it to follow the eighth inch tape to some degree. And take a couple more little pieces of tape. What do you want? Get out of here. I wish I could teach him to ink. Now, once I'm happy with this, now beware, if you get too close to the eighth inch tape, the ink runs underneath it, which happens to me from time to time, and then I think, why don't I just, when I'm done, pretty much from this point on, I don't need the eighth inch tape, I could just leave it off. And look at that from a lot of angles. Working with big pens, the corners get rounded, and then I fill it in with a smaller pen when I'm done. 
make the point the corners pointed again we have this time window this has to dry if I try to move this and it slides into the ink it can make a mess okay, now you can see that what I'm going to try to do is by hand I don't know how effective this is going to be with one of the really fine pens to find that corner a little more in fact I just don't want to smear it and if I've now I've got a little tail hanging out there I just have to wait for that to dry and once it's dry I can So even though I, when I look through the macro lens, I can see little spots. Through the macro lens, you can see them. But with your naked eye, you can't see them. So I'm not going to worry about it too much. Unless they start to appearance point planes with a macro lens, which I doubt. Now, the next thing is to lay out the line that will be the opening where the two doors actually come together. And I can do this with, I have some 16th inch tape. Can lay this out. Now what I thought would look effective here, again everything, everything in the beginning you think is gonna be effective, is to lay it out with two thin lines as if they had a joint and that actually was the joint where the doors they are you know like a refrigerator door it doesn't seal Ooh, this thing is just long enough I want to get it as straight as possible and the neat thing with ink is you can spend an infinite amount of time you're not you don't add any weight so you're really in a position, the best of all worlds, where you can add detail and not wait. It's not like spraying on coat after coat of clear or making some other detail feature that starts to build weight. I doubt if you could even measure the amount of weight that ink adds to a plane. Now what I'm going to try to do, let's see if we can do this. If it doesn't look good, I'll just fill it in, of course. And the ink gives you a lot of leeway to a little how much you want to add, how detailed you want to make it, how realistic you want to make it. A lot of possibilities. You're not, you're not restricted or limited in any way. You let your imagination run wild. Yeah, it looks like, now see this is a typical thing that happens. See that the blob of ink? If you try to wipe it off now it's a problem. You just let it dry and scratch it off. Now, I'm not sure if that's <laughs> that's what I, but it certainly looks like two doors that would come together. Now while I have it upside down, I want to lay out the ink that would be the the place where the gear would retract into the nacelles also, and do that with the wide pen. In real life, this really draws your your eye right to it. And once that's, I guess I, I guess I have to look at this realistically. Once that's shaded and the clear on there and everything, that's that's going to jump out a little bit more than it does now. Especially when somebody flips the model over and you can see all these details that are on the bottom. Now because we've extended the nacelles, this is kind of difficult to, uh, to get proportional. But we've got the basic, the basic layout, the basic idea of it. Of course we can't take into account the gear block. That wouldn't be part of what we were doing on the prototypical plane. But we can get this 
roughly the length of the wheel and the, the gear strut so it kind of looks like it would retract down in there. And then what I'll try to do is something similar to this where there's a, a defined opening where the two doors would more than likely come together. Having these doors right in place, see what I can do is this this has an incline that would normally blank out that part of it. It kind of evens it out, makes it look a little more realistic. I also need to put and basically then just connect the dots with this. It's not going to work. Good that you see how many mistakes I make because that's the challenge. Is and I can't bend that to the angle I want and get this a lot closer than the other one though. Nope. Sometimes you do have to go back and forth. And maybe I don't have that tape right because it's not bending to the angle I want. Okay, we'll just have to compromise that a little bit. So we're on such a kind of a parabolic shape here. It's not picking up the ink line exactly where I want it to. Now really, I think it looks real nice that some of the ink lines are a little bit thicker. It, it really does make it more realistic. Again, you have to wait, especially with big pens, there's a longer dry time. You have to be really careful it's dry. Once I get these two lines in, then I'm going to try to get that, that opening line where these would come together. Now, it looks like the next thing I need to do is figure out what other ink lines are going to be on. Hey, you want to help me or get off of my arm? What other ink work we would be including up here, if any. And then I'll be able to, well, that'll probably be all I'll get done today. But then I'll be able to flip this and start figuring out the top side. Now what we've been doing, we've been connecting, bring this line in, connecting it this way. Les Demet is here giving me a little inspiration. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the right word. Perspiration. Perspiration. Sir. We connected all those lines. Now we're still trying to figure out where we want to do the lining in the back. And we know there are going to be two lines up here. The top, this is a separate piece. But it's certainly better to have two, uh, you know, two sets of eyes than one, that's for sure. Russ has been telling me he just, he just thinks I ought to dump this in the trunk of his car and <laughs> Right, right. I'll take care of it from here. <laughs> and I have reached a a, uh, a joint corporate decision. We're trying to get out of here. We're trying to come up with a way of getting that ink line on the back. And this looks like our, our first, last, and only... Uh, you know what I could do with this? Is cut this piece out so it wasn't a cup. Yeah. I mean, these are expensive. They're a nickel a piece. Let's see. Sometimes you have to improvise. Wait, before you... Well, we got a thousand of these cups. I mean, well, but that it, ain't gonna work. A nickel a piece. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering if... I wonder if you hold it and I ink it, it's a gonna be a two-man job, though. Well, that's right, but we have to make sure it's on the right axis. Yeah, you've gotta connect it. Okay. That's why we have highly skilled technicians between the two of us we can uh, Les came up with a, even a better idea we're going to try to do this with 64th plywood and make a ring that attaches to the bed believe it or not sometimes one thing like this it's like it's oh look at this erase that off the tape eh, no we never erase tape that's what happened because I got the grain going so what I'm trying to do is get the grain going in this dirt. it might even be big enough and make the equivalent of a little then Les is going to be responsible for holding it in place, so if it's crooked, I can blame him. That's right. Matter of fact, I'm going to take a paint brush. You know what's impossible? Is it because we can't this. hold this wing sideways, it's a pain. That's okay. No, this side we can't use. we got to use this side. We'll figure this out. We don't go to the moon because it's easy. We go because we're dumb. Okay, see, that's still rough. That's, gonna, that's not going to leave a good line.
We could even try doing this with that plastic part. Where is that? Here. But you got to be the one to... You see, the thing is, with, with holding it... Yeah. I wonder if you can wrap it the whole perimeter. Yeah, but are we, is that going to stand off enough? Yeah, it, it stands. Push? Yeah, no, it doesn't. You're going to have to put some extra... Put extra tape hey, on the back right. of this. Okay. Right. So it shows you what we know. Exactly. Test and see if we can even do this. But then we have to turn it over and connect the dots. Mm. But it looks to me like you're going to get 70 or 75 percent of it on the first pass. Well, we'll find out. Okay. We'll just see how much we can get. And one stroke at a pen here. trying to make them even so we measured forward and at that point in time Les said what <laughs> why didn't you build a cardinal <laughs> that's exactly right okay you got it well you're the hold guy I'm the ink guy see I get the easy job we're close the we're senior part eliminate all right now if you can draw I had no idea it was hurting that much for now what do you think? Have we reached the point where we ought to flip it over? That's, I think that's... <laughs> that is saturation. This is why I like having two sets of eyes around, especially somebody who's got a, a conservative point of view, not somebody, you know... Somebody like Ski Dombrowski would just be saying, yes, flip it over. I think so. I think we're ready to flip, because we have to connect these lines now. We have to play and connect the set, dots. So that'll set you up for the top as soon as we do that. I think the Bombay door stands out enough. The gear doors stand out. Okay, let's flip. All right. Now we do you have. Know what? It ain't too bad going back the other way either. I would okay. say you could use the same. If you same keep one. it, if you reference this line here and right. try to keep that, I think we'll be we'll be close enough that it'll look scale. And you know, there's some flexibility in this thing. You can play with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we want to... Now you just want to determine. Do you want to end it at the de icer boot? How, see how it ends on the real plane? It kind of... We don't have that fillet. That's, That's the right. problem. That's right. That's a scale fillet. If we had a big fillet, that would be easy. So I think we should just kind of end it and let it go out into the de icer boot. Either that or you could carry it just a little bit further and draw a line into the de icer Okay, boot into right the de icer boot. Yeah, instead of so trying to make... This apparently, this seam line here goes right to the leading edge fillet. So if you, without the fillet, you draw it to the leading edge. Let's go to the middle of the de-icer boot yep. and see how it looks. Yep. You don't need the back now because we have hair. don't need the we back. Had a, we smudged up the whole front of the line. Yeah. That's all you need is from here. Let this just dog tail back. This is dry. All right. Now that, that's got to come over a little bit more. I just want to get... Right there. All right, okay. let's give that a try. No, we're not matching up nope. as well as we should, so... Not at all. That's not going to make it. Okay, let's wipe that. Now, whenever that happens, of course, there's a very easy solution. When you get it early. Okay, now let's... You know, if you don't show these mistakes to people, then they think when they have a mistake, well, yeah, where if they see, see every, the world, yeah. see, how many times do you do this before you get it right? Well, that's okay. Nobody knows. Okay. Try 672. <laughs> Take, outtakes. Oh, yeah, okay. I think we, we may have to put more tape under this piece of plywood. Well, why don't we do it now before we, yeah, before yeah. we Wipe See, it. we only have two. Oh, there's only two layers on here. That's what's what's happening. You have this, and I'm trying to I'm trying to show religiously that no matter how careful you are, unless is a a true expert ink man who uh, <laughs> I'll be when you sold here. For when <laughs> yeah, I hope. And you want to buy a used bridge? <laughs> we'll sell you Les McDonald's home phone number. All right, here, a couple extra layers of tape. And you could bet on the next shot we're going to have this perfect 
Billy Mitchell's going to come right over. Hey, you know, three days ago was the day of the, the anniversary of the Tokyo Raid. Is that right? And I look, I'm looking on TV the other night, and there's a movie called Tokyo Raiders. So I go and record the movie. I turn it on. It's some Oriental movie. Oh, sh- <laughs> you know, with, with Kung Fu and every. Oh, man. They should make that against the law. Okay, now we have extra tape on this. So let's put it on both sides. Otherwise, this thing tends to bend like a pretzel. You know, I'll tell you something. If you could invent something that would bend like a pretzel, but evenly. Yeah, evenly, yeah. Well, that blue thing didn't turn out to be... Well, it was... Now, Les hasn't had good luck with that in his inking not career, too. Board, not on a drawing board. Not on a drawing board. It yeah. just does not bend to uh, give you a nice even... Yeah. Line. But a lot of times a tool looks like you say, wow, that's going to work perfect, and when you try it, you know, or the opposite, it doesn't look like it would work, and yet it's perfect. For, it's it's funny, because for most of the model airplane drawing that I've done, you know, 35 and 60 size ships, right. even the, the curves are pretty subtle, but you can buy relatively inexpensive ship's curves. Oh, sure. To do that, you know. Now we have extra tape. Now we're going to get this on the next shot. There Guaranteed. Les guarantees that in writing. Uh-huh. Like I said, Les said we're going to get it in within two shots. <laughs> I'm running out of Q-tips here. Okay. But that's the way this... And without this line, I don't, you know, it loses a little bit. It loses a lot. And we're not, we're not looking to you know, be the first guy to the finish line. We want to be the best. All right, you get you okay. get your line on the back. Okay. We're about where we were in the front. Okay. Now it just, if you can, Wendy, can't the pen? Ah, oh, oh, shoot! Take it away. We'll what do happened? it again. What see, well, see, it's crisp, but I don't know. No, what that is. no, we're gonna put more tape. Yeah, your fingernail was there. That's okay. This is what makes it, you know, that everybody in the world can do. Because they'll say, "Gee, I can do that better than Wendy," and they're probably right. Okay, last chance saloon. Lose the fingernails. Right. What's happening? See, because we're we're curving it that way. Yeah, we're forcing the. If edge you just put on one the finger there, just right. one there. That's right. all we need. That's all we got. Now see. Okay, let's try this. Uh, what's uh, causing that? We may have to put ten layers of tape under this to get it done. It's cause it's bending down in that dimension. See, we're getting closer and closer to leading edge here. <laughs> yeah, pretty soon we're going to be on the table. Okay, but that's no problem either. But we'll do it again. I'm going to put more tape on it. Because we've got to do this four times, so let's... Yeah. Why don't we learn it right now? Yep. We go to inking the, school here. Get the equipment right, and then... Inking we'll, 101. The we're going to put ten more layers of tape. The other three will be fine. Uh, how many tries did we legitimately do? <laughs> <laughs> After we... <laughs> After the first one, it was a piece of cake. Oh, yeah. But the first one was a bear. Okay, so now we have only the lines that normally define the, the nacelles. And the line, show me again here, the this line between the two dihedral breaks is straight, but then it cants forward? Right, right. Th- from here to here. It's a straight line. Right. They're all straight lines across the middle, and then it breaks to the rear following the, the, uh, the slant of the leading edge. Okay. But it's interesting. You can see how the airplane, you know, how it was uh, engineered. Yeah, yeah, that's probably right on a spore. Obviously, that's yep. the wing spore. Yep. Okay, so we need to get a line. We need to get the line. The final yeah. line between and the here. nacelles. Right. Okay, between the two dihedral breaks. Right. Between the two dihedral breaks, and we've laid out the dihedral breaks with eighth inch tape, and Les is going to try to put some indentations into the nacelles there as he presses the ruler. I'm trying down. real hard. <laughs> This way, every dent in this okay. plane, I can blame on Les. As soon as his hands touch it once, every fingernail mark is his problem. You got it. Now that goes right. We we should put in the two dihedral brake lines first, because we otherwise we're working in midair here. Yeah, but what I want to do is see. Now I'm I've got to guess that when you put this in, this is at a right angle to the. Oh yeah, right. yeah, that's so exactly. Now we extend this out. To we'll measure to the trailing edge. Measure down, and you'll see if it if it's off a sixty fourth of an inch. Yeah, but the trail. Okay, that's that's to tell you the truth, not what I'm concerned about. Because that's a defining line. That that's the wing spar. I'm sure that's the center wing spar. That's the reason it's ninety degrees. Yep, sure is. Right. Was that accurate? Right on the money. Right on the money. What a surprise! The only thing on a plane that's a straight line. 
the only straight line on this whole plane. Yeah. Just to double check something. That the triangle yeah. came wrapped in. I know exactly what you're thinking. Alright. He's using a 90 degree. The ruler, the ruler off the bell crank mount, and then a 90 degree to get the dihedral brake lines. 90 degrees. I'm not getting help from Chicky. What has she got? He I think he like just pooped on you. Again? In sport, no, we got to go over the nacelles. That line goes we right over the nacelles. Yeah, but we got to do this before we put that midline in. We got to put the break point. Okay, right, right. You need the break point. Okay. Plus, we have a 90 degree line here. And Wes says, uh, conveniently enough, put a 90 degree line that we can use for reference. Now, when it comes to some of these parts, like this one right here, where we're trying to get the main spar inked in. We have a line that is a 90 degree reference, because don't forget the leading edge and the trailing edge, are just, they both taper, so it's a double pain in the neck. You can't reference off the leading edge or the trailing edge in either case. For that main spar, now you've got a, this is gonna be a prototypical line, so we wanna get this right. Mm -hmm. If we're main spar, what we're gonna do is measure forward, because this is a 90 degree line, measure forward, the distance that we've scientifically evaluated and computerized and uh, it looks like it splits it right in half. It does. It, it, so just measure it and go by the half. Right, exactly. Let's cut it right in half, this distance and then that distance. And that'll be the line. And that'll take, a, we can put a little dot on the tape, a dot on the tape and just connect the line. It skips some of the panels though. Measuring up, making a center line, a little template so that we can get the uh, the hatch, I guess that's an, some kind of a hatch on a real plane, get that centered, then we can lay out the template using that for the center line. You're pretty good, I didn't know you were this good. If I knew you were this good, did you chick impress chicken me poop on service. you twice a day. <laughs> that's good, yeah, that's good. Yeah, if they were off even a little bit, you'd notice it and it would look terrible. Okay, so we got, now what do we need? We need the other half of the main wing spar? Yeah, well, the, we have a wing spar that goes from, literally from tip to tip, that's a straight line along about here. Okay. So that's you know, this, this kind of detail. Yeah, the little boxes and little... Trim tabs and hinge lines. Most of that will be on the flaps, and I think what we did is we have some of the lines much thicker. These are 120s, these are 60s kind of a variety of line thicknesses to to make this look as realistic as it possibly can. That's looking like we got that's looking like we've got what we're gonna get. Now, tomorrow what I'll do I'll put it on the flaps. I guess we got the flaps that'll there's nothing with it nothing else goes in the forward part of the nacelles. No lines go on that. Got to do the flaps. Got to do the shading. So we'll be ready for the clear in a couple of days. Actually, there are two lines that go on the forward part of the nacelles. Where do they go? One along from this line here. Forward? Forward. Outboard of the supercharger? Outboard, outboard and inboard of the supercharger. Okay, let's draw them in. Yeah. That's why we have the documentation. In case I decide to enter this and scale it, then that's somebody else. Like, fun ah! scale. Yeah, fun, fun, fun labor scale. Now Wes is very happy. He's a happy boy. Oh, this is, this is amazing here. That looks okay. You're happy with that? Yeah. I get to see what we're we did the interco interconnected with the rivet lines that are truly scale. Hmm, I'm not sure anything's truly scale on this plane. I think we did our job. I'll do the flaps tomorrow. That's for sure. That's that's an amazing amount of work today. You are the man. And I'll tell you, I'll never ink a plane alone again. <laughs> Where am I thrilled about that? Yeah, that's gonna that really. I think Dave Downey would even approve of this. 
Dave, they're talking about you. Don't worry, spit evaporates. I spit on it before, too. Tomorrow, the flaps. That is amazing. That really, that really made it come alive. When you put the cowlings on, it really looks good. Not too prejudiced, am I? <laughs> All right, that's it for today. Wendy, if Case you are, closed. If you are proud of this, and you should... You want to move to Jersey? We just had a hailstorm. Look at the hail out in the driveway. Karen, I don't believe it. Oh, I hope the cars didn't get whacked. But now it's it raining. It stopped hail and now it's pouring. Look at the size of those Ooh. crystals, though. Yeah, that's ice. That's pretty cool. I guess you don't get that in Anaheim very often. That, that's hail, my friend. Good thing it isn't hailing on my B25. Some days it's fun to be windy. No, it's not funny. We really had a giant hailstorm here last night. It was unbelievable. There's piles of hail on the driveway. I really like the way this, the ink on the wing looks. I'm going to do the shading probably on the next tape. We're at the end of this tape. Just trying to get our bearings here. Make sure we haven't left out something that we really wanted to replicate. Les Dennett was a great help. He really is a, a master of doing ink work. And I think he's one of the reasons this came out as, as prototypical as it did. I really think this is going to add a nice dimension to our V25 project. And of course, one of the other things we're looking forward to very soon, we're going to finish up the gear. We have the clear on them. The clear is drying now. Get some real pavement gear for Miss Ashley and see if this carbon wing is going to round out into one of our favorite planes or just become another test model. We don't know. So far, so good. It's been looking like it's going to have a real, a real future in our Air Force. Be rolling and the, the flying season is going to break and we're going to be out with the new Z-Tron. Looking forward to flying this again. What's nice about having an Air Force like this, you don't get bored flying the same plane over and over again. And of course to get some time on this the bubble jet tank, see if this is going to fit into our program. More time on 35s with the Z-Tron and the throttle control. So many things to do, so many interesting things to do, so many things to learn. Did you learn anything today, Chicky? Yeah, don't go out in the driveway with a tail and you'll get wet. <laughs> and here's a little sneak preview. Dave Downey and Joe Adamusco both are working on getting some pictures of that biplane. I think it's called the Hawk. I'm not sure what their other designation is. I've already got computers at, pictures out on my computer, but I can't download them yet. I'm really looking forward to seeing how Joe, uh, Dave Downey, of course, is going to make a set of plans we can look at. Another exciting project. And then we're looking forward to our upcoming trip to England this summer. Sometimes I wonder if I just don't have too many projects, too many things going on at the same time. But boy, is it a blast. Anyway, thanks a lot for sharing this wonderful adventure with us. This has really been a blast. So when I look back at all the time I've spent, the Spitfire time, the Miss Ashley time, the B-25 time, I always come to the conclusion, I always ask myself the question, what could I be doing that would be more fun than what we're already doing? I just don't think it ever gets any better than, than it already is. I just think this is the best time of our lives. And I'm so happy we can all share it with the tapes. And thanks to everyone who sends me photos and sends me little uh, notations about what they're doing. And that we're all sharing the world of model airplanes together. Another thing we're scheduling real soon, we're going to be going out to Bobby Hunts and having another, another one of those wild bike riding sessions.
again, thanks for joining us, and please share the tapes. And as I put this tape to sleep, one last final bit of information. Jimmy Cassell has moved back to northern New Jersey, and may get to see him at the flying field this summer. Always a fun guy to hang around with. And as I've always said, for me anyway, life is an adventure, and if you know where you're going, it can't be much of an adventure. And boy, when we started out this project many months ago, I really didn't know where we were going. I'm not sure I know where we're going now, but I know getting there is a lot of fun. We'll see you on the next tape.